Howdy. Howdy. Let's be honest. You guys are glad to be here instead of school today, aren't you? Yes. And how many of you are just hoping with all you got we're going to get snow tomorrow? I know you're thinking about it. All right, well, today may be your snow day because you're not in the classroom today, but you're going to learn an awful lot. And we know that you've got a lot of things that the principals and the teachers have planned for you today, but you're going to learn an awful lot if you pay good attention over this next few minutes. And hopefully you did by watching the nice uh, film that was produced by the folks here at the library. We do welcome you to the Reading Discovery Program sponsored by the Barbara Bush Literacy Corps and the Barbara Bush Foundation for Family Literacy. I'll be the moderator for this program today. It's my honor to do this. Uh, over the years, I'm Mike Wright, the general manager of KBTX TV, and I know an awful lot of you in this house because I, too, have a couple of kids who attend Pebble Creek Elementary as part of the College Station ISD, and I know that you are here today along with a lot of our friends from the Bryan ISD. This program is organized by the Education Department of the George Bush Presidential Library. The Education Department's mission is to inform and enrich learning about American history, the role of the presidency, and to enhance learning through support of literacy programs. Our theme today deals with first ladies of the United States. These women hold significant influence and have made major contributions to American history. The Reading Discovery Program has the twofold purpose of showing, one, the excitement of reading, which you're encouraged to do in your classrooms, and two, the fun approaches to becoming a better reader. We suggest using a reading buddy and singing that are two helpful ways to expand your reading skills in any language. Your reading buddy could be your pet, a friend, a parent or a grandparent. We appreciate greatly the help of the distance learning team at Region 6 Education Service Center in Huntsville. They're going to play a big role in today's program and we'll tell you about the exciting part that they do in just a second. Mrs. Solo, Mrs. Taylor, Mrs. Davis, Mrs. Tijerina, and Mr. Robin all joined together at the Region 6 to make this possible. Also a big thanks to the distance learning specialists throughout Texas who make connections for your region with us today. For the first time, we have reading friends from the Royal Botanic Kew Gardens in the UK. They'll be joining us thanks to the help of Mrs. Willis, the manager of the Texas Education Telecommunications Network. Let's please give an applause to our distance learning teams to show our appreciation in this morning for bringing us together. The 2011 Reading Discovery Program has nearly 32,000 readers that are tuning in right now to see you at the George Bush Presidential Library Conference Center, in which it's wonderful testament to the support of literacy in our state. Mrs. Bush and our reading buddies on stage, who came out a little bit earlier, will read selections from the book First Ladies, Women Who Call the White House Home by Beatrice Gormley, published by Scholastic. This book will be distributed throughout Texas from regional education service centers. A special thanks to everyone for helping to distribute these books to your classrooms. The book funding is organized by the Bush Library's Education Department with grants from the Barbara Bush Foundation for Family Literacy, the Junior League of Bryan College Station, and the College Station Rotary Club. It is now with great honor and pleasure that we introduce to you the former First Lady, Barbara Bush. do what she says. <laughs> good, good morning, Mrs. Bush. <laughs> Mrs. Bush's number one cause is family literacy. The Barbara Bush Foundation for Family Literacy nurtures family reading projects. Mrs. Bush is a best-selling author who has written four books. With Mrs. Bush today is Beatrice Gormley, the author of today's featured book. Mrs. Bush will now read some selections from First Ladies, Women Who Called the White House Home. Thank you. Thank you. Martha Dandridge Curtis Washington was the wife of 
<laughs> Just want to see if you're awake. <laughs> George Washington, the first president of the United States. Growing up, she learned to manage a large household, entertain guests, to play the spinet, and ride horseback. Once she rode her horse into her Uncle William's house and up the stairs, but her father refused to scold her. She's not harmed William's staircase, he pointed out, and by heavens, how she can ride. At the age of 17, Martha married, but her first husband died when Martha was 25, leaving her to run the plantation. When she met Colonel George Washington of the Virginia militia, she decided within days that they were perfectly suited. They were married in January of 1759 about the year I was born. Okay. <laughs> Every winter, as the War of the American Revolution slowed down, Mrs. Washington joined her husband in camp. At Valley Forge during the winter of 1777 and 78, her heart went out to the sick, starving, ragged soldiers. She visited them every day. She persuaded the other officers' wives to join her in patching the soldiers' clothes, knitting socks, and making shirts. After the revolution was won, George Washington was elected the first president of the United States of America. He and Mrs. Washington would rather have gone, to go, gone back to their pleasant life at Mount Vernon, but they both felt he had a responsibility to the new nation. She carried out her official entertaining duties in a gracious, low-key style. Lady Washington did not allow politics to be discussed at her receptions and dinners, and she ended evening events at 9 o'clock so that President Washington could get his rest. At the end of her husband's presidency, Mrs. Washington happily returned to Mount Vernon. The general and I feel like children just released from school, she wrote a friend. You know, uh, I made socks for George Bush when he was in the Navy. And he said they would have fit an elephant. They were so big. Anyway, I gave up knitting. Abigail Smith Adams was the wife of John Adams, the second president of the United States. Abigail was bright and an avid reader with a keen interest in politics. But since she was a girl, the current attitude of the day meant that she would never be allowed to attend college. When she was 17, Abigail met John Adams, a lawyer who was 10 years older. Discovering their mutual interest in books and politics, they began exchanging long, lively letters. Abigail and John were married at her father's parsonage when she was 19 years old. John, I was too. <laughs> Just a fact. John Adams served in the First and Second Continental Congresses in Philadelphia. Her, in her letters, Mrs. Adams kept him up to date on the politics in Massachusetts and shared her ideas for shaping the new American government. Mrs. Adams reminded her husband to remember the ladies, meaning that women should be allowed the right to own property and be given protection against abusive husbands. Unfortunately, Mr. Adams did not take her advice on either slavery or women's rights. When John Adams was elected president in 1776, Abigail Adams was nervous about following Lady Washington, but actually she held livelier social events, encouraging wittier conversation and political discussion. She was the first president's wife to live in the White House, where she hung the laundry in the unfinished East Room. President Adams asked her opinion of his speeches, and he discussed the business of government with her. She was also the first president's wife to influence the press. Abigail Adams sent information favorable to the Adams administration to the newspaper editors. After the presidency, Mrs. Adams was delighted to go back to running the farm in Braintree, where she could enjoy the company of her husband and her children and grandchildren. 
I wonder what kind of luck she had on getting the press to print nice things about her family. <laughs> Dolly Payne Todd Madison was the wife of James Madison, the fourth president of the United States. Dolly was born to Quaker parents, and she was brought up on her father's plantation in Virginia in the strict discipline of the Society of Friends, the Quakers, always wearing plain gray dresses. But Dolly's grandmother, Coles, who was not a Quaker, introduced her to elegant food and clothes. In 1783, Dolly's father freed his slaves and moved the family to Philadelphia. At 21, Dolly married a Quaker lawyer who tragically died three years later. She was unusually pretty with a sunny, friendly nature. In May of 1794, James Madison, congressman from Virginia, began courting her. His friends, George and Martha Washington, tried to convince her to accept him. But Dolly was not sure she wanted to marry the great little Madison, as she called him. He was 17 years older and an Episcopalian rather than a Quaker. They were married on September 15, 1794, and she happily took up a life that included fine clothes and lavish entertaining. The Madisons moved to the new capital, Washington, D.C., when he was appointed Thomas Jefferson's Secretary of State. President Jefferson, a widower, depended on Mrs. Madison to act as a hostess for him. Her dinners and parties were so stylish that she was dubbed the Queen of Washington City. When James Madison ran for president, Dolly Madison accompanied him on the campaign trail, winning many friends with her charm and tact. It was obvious to others that the Madison's marriage was close and loving. She never took much interest in politics, but she was fiercely patriotic, giving parties during the War of 1812 to celebrate America's victories. In August 1814, when the British were about to invade Washington, President Madison insisted his wife leave for Virginia immediately. But Dolly Madison took the time to pack a wagon with valuables that included the famous portrait of George Washington. She escaped the city just ahead of the British troops. Abigail Powers Fillmore was married to Millard Fillmore, the 13th President of the United States. Her father died soon after Abigail's birth, leaving little money but many books. Her mother decided to take Abigail and her brother to the frontier where they had relatives. There the mother used the library to educate Abigail and her brother at home. At 16, Abigail became a teacher. At 19, teaching at the academy, she met Millard Fillmore. He was inspired by her passionate dedication to learning and her respect for him. They were married in 1826. Abigail Fillmore continued teaching until her son was born in 1828, making her the first lady to hold a job after getting married. Upon moving into the White House, Abigail Fillmore was shocked to find that there was no proper library. She asked the president to have Congress appropriate money for one and personally selected the books for the library in the Oval Room upstairs. President Fillmore sometimes talked over the business of his office with his wife, but he did not take her best piece of advice not to sign the Fugitive Slave Act. This decision ruined Millard Fillmore's chances for re-election. Now, this is one of my favorite. Anna Eleanor Roosevelt was the wife of Franklin D. Roosevelt, the 32nd President of the United States. As Eleanor was growing up, her mother, a society beauty, was disappointed in her homely, shy daughter and favored Eleanor's two younger brothers. Eleanor adored her affectionate father. By the time Eleanor was 10, both parents had died and she was living with her strict grandmother Hall. At 18, Eleanor made her debut in New York City. She was almost six feet tall 
and plain. She was dreading the social world, but it brought her together with the handsome, charming Harvard student, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He was impressed when distant cousin Eleanor took him on a tour of the tenements on the Lower East Side where she was teaching in a settlement house. When he was 23 and she 20, they were married in New York. After World War I, Eleanor began to get seriously involved in politics, encouraged by her husband. In 1921, Franklin was stricken with polio and paralyzed. Eleanor not only cared for him during his illness, but urged him to continue his political career. In 1928, she helped him campaign for governor of New York and win. Governor Roosevelt could not travel, so Mrs. Roosevelt became his eyes and ears, visiting state prisons and hospitals, reporting on how they were run. Convinced that her husband could lead America out of the Great Depression, Mrs. Roosevelt worked hard on his successful campaign in 1932. In her first year as First Lady, she traveled 38,000 miles around the country from slums in Puerto Rico to villages in Maine. She urged the president and his officials to improve federal programs. Also, she held her own weekly press conferences. After President Roosevelt's death, Eleanor Roosevelt continued to work for the goals they had shared. President Harry S. Truman sent her to the newly created United Nation, where she chaired the commission that wrote the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Those are pretty impressive ladies, I think. When you consider that she went 38,000 miles and traveling even 1932 was not easy. No. I mean, these women were something. All right, thank you very much, Mrs. Bush. <laughs> Twenty-one questions were selected this year from our question and answer session from your many submissions. Now we'll begin with Darby from Pebble Creek Elementary School. The principal is Mrs. Annette Rohrbach. They're with College Station Independent School District. Darby, first question on stage. Hello, Mrs. Bush. My name is Darby. I am in the fourth grade. My teacher is Ms. Westbrook and my librarian is Ms. Whitty. My question is, what were some of your duties at the White House? That's a good question, Darby. I, I'm not sure I had duties, but I did a lot of things. Uh, first of all, I oversaw the dining room china we used, I saw uh, the meals we ate. Um, then I did a lot of charitable things. You know, when you're in the White House, as Lady Bird says, you have a bully pulpit. People listen to you just because you married the president. You can be the world's biggest dummy, but <laughs> they'll listen. And so that was the, one of the things I did. I tried to do something every day that would help someone else. That's what I did. All right, thank you. All right, now we go to Region 6, where Mrs. Solo, Component Director for Technology Services, will facilitate and moderate the video conference as we visit with schools across Texas. And this morning, we say a big Texas A&M hello to Mrs. Solo. Thanks, Mike. Thank you very, very much. Mrs. Bush, we so appreciate all the hard work you do to encourage kids to read and show them how much fun reading can be. On behalf of all the Education Service Centers and the kids and teachers of Texas, thank you so much for all your efforts. Thank you. Now, without further ado, there are a lot of schools out there that are anxious to ask you a question. So let's start with Region 13, Hayes CISD, Buddha Elementary. Are you there? Hello, Mrs. Bush. Hello. My name is Drew. Hello, I'm Drew. in the fifth grade. Dr. Epp is, is my teacher. Ms. Dita is my librarian. What do you think is the most challenging thing about being First Lady of the United States? What is the most challenging 
thing about being First Lady of the United States? Well, I would say really keeping your family together. And uh, in my case, I seem to have an open mouth on every subject. So the, one of my challenges was not saying what I thought all the time, <laughs> but mostly the children, grandchildren. I mean, it's very important. It's very important for everybody to uh, cherish their families. So I'd say that with, along with the political side and all the duties that you have and uh, the travel that you do, the keeping your children happy and close to you. Hmm. Thank you very much, Drew. A good question. It was a good question. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go to Region 2, Gregory Portland ISD, East Cliff Elementary. Are you there? Yes. Good. Hello, Mrs. Bush. Hello. Hello, Mrs. My name is Urgen. I'm in third grade. My teacher is Mrs. Garza, and my librarian is Mrs. Duran. My question is, who inspired you when you were first lady? Who inspired me when I was first lady? Lady Bird Johnson. Hmm. I really thought she was a great lady. I knew her well. I liked her very much. And, and Lady Bird is the one who said, you know, being First Lady gives you a, a wonderful ch opportunity to speak up for heart or cancer or reading or whatever you're interested in. And uh, I, th I think she was a very great, gentle First Lady and I liked her very, very much. And she, she allowed me to get out and do things that I was hoping would help America. So she, she, she inspired me. Then I must say my mother-in-law, who I adored, was um, very, very gentle. She had four daughters-in-law and one son-in-law. And all four of us thought we were her favorite. I knew <laughs> I was. And uh, I think that's a good lesson. I have four daughters-in-law and one son-in-law, just as my mother-in-law did. And I do love all my daughters-in-law, and I hope they all think they're my favorite. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we're going to go to Region 5, Hardin-Jefferson ISD, Sour Lake Elementary. Are you there? Hello, Miss Bush. My name is Chastity. I'm in the fifth grade. Miss Taggart is my teacher, and Miss McCaw is my librarian. My question is, what is your happiest memory from living in the White House? Chastity, that's a very good question. I hate to tell you this. I loved living in the White House. I have lots of happy memories. We had two children at that time who lived in the Washington area, and I loved hearing my grandchildren giggling and laughing and I could hear them riding bikes around on the south lawn and I, I just loved that part and I loved the people who worked there uh, we we weren't very spoiled we had 90 people whose only job was to see that we were happy <laughs> and comfortable and when we had a uh, plumbing problem just one telephone call did it all but anyway having said that um, that we went back to Washington this week. How many years has it been? We left in 1992. Uh, the, some of the same people were at the White House. We went back to Washington and they came over to see us at our hotel. They were like family. So it, it isn't what you think the White House is like. It's, it's a family place if you make it thus, and we did. We had lots of loving times there. Okay, let's go to the panhandle, to Region 16, Silverton ISD, Silverton School. Are you there? Hello, Ms. Bush. My name is Cash. I'm in the third grade. Ms. Huff is my teacher and Ms. Brock is my librarian. My question is, why you lived in the White House? What was your favorite holiday to celebrate? That's a great question. The White House at Christmas 
is the most unbelievable place in the world. And all our family came every year to the White House. And <clears throat> you're so cute. <laughs> came every year to the White House. And uh, then when George was president, we would we'd go up, to, we'd come to the White House, see that beautiful house, all the wonderful volunteers and the trees and the decorations. And then we'd go to Camp David, all our family. And when George W. was president, every year he invited us up there. And we did the same thing. So for 12 years, we had beautiful Christmas time. Then we allowed the in-laws to have uh, their family at Easter. <laughs> uh, we're gonna go to Region 12, Karen's ISD, Karen's Elementary. Are you there? Yes, we're here. Hello, Mrs. Bush. My name is Daisy, and I'm in the third grade. Miss Frost is my teacher, and Miss Quinn is my librarian. My question is, what was the most important thing you learned while you lived at the White House? What was the most important thing that you learned? That I learned at the White House. You know what I learned at the White House? That Because we had visitors from all over the world. We had... Um, Mark Valenza, the Queen of England, Queen of Sweden. We just had a, a we had um, Sadat of Egypt. We had a lot of great guests. And you know what? They all are just people. They, they're nice, wonderful people. And you don't have to worry about meeting people who are um, kings or queens or, as uh, John Conley used to say, potentates, whatever that meant. <laughs> but anyway, you can meet anybody and be very comfortable with them because they're just like you. In fact, you may grow up to be a queen. Who knows? <laughs> Daisy, is that your name? You're very pretty. <laughs> We're going to stay at Region 12. Belton ISD, Sparta, are you there? Yes, we are. Mm -hmm. Hello, Mrs. Bush. My name is Gloria, and I am a first grader. My teacher is Mr. Burke, and my librarian is Mrs. Burke. My question is, how has the role of first lady changed over the years? Oh, that's a good question. How has the role of the first lady changed over the years? It's changed dramatically, to tell you the honest truth, because originally, except for Mrs. Roosevelt and the ladies we read about maybe, but now the first lady, uh, I choose my very favorite first lady, my daughter-in-law, Laura Bush, but she traveled to uh, countries that were in dire problems and took breast cancer, uh, discussions to them and preventative. She went to uh, Afghanistan, I think three times maybe. Oh. Now they wouldn't do that in the olden days and even in my day you wouldn't go over. I wasn't that courageous. But she did a lot of things. She took literacy to Russia. She brought Mrs. Putin to see the book fair that the Library of Congress and she put on. They would have 80,000 people on the mall and 100,000 by the end. And she took Mrs. Putin to see it. Then she took American authors whose books were translated into Russian over and helped her start one in Russia. Mm. I mean, she's an amazing woman. But be because it was all right for her to do those things, it wasn't quite so all right for me to speak up. At least I felt it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Anyway, thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move to Region 3, Victoria ISD, O'Connor Elementary. Are you there? Yes, right. We're here. Hello. Olivia. No? Yes. Hello, Mrs. Bush. My name is Olivia. I am in the third grade. Miss Whitaker is my teacher, and Miss Miller is my librarian. My question is, why do you think reading is so important? Olivia, 
I think reading is probably the most important thing that you can do. I think um, if you can't read, you can't read medicine bottles, you can't read um, uh, instructions on how to put a machine together. Now I can read, but I can't put a machine together. But <laughs> anyway, reading is very important. It takes you to places around the world that maybe you won't physically be able to go to, but you can read about and you feel you know it. Um, I, I'm a great believer in everyone in the United States of America speaking English and reading English. And I think that's very, very important. How do you know when to cross a street if it doesn't say go? You've got to learn to read. It will open doors that you never dreamt would open to you. That's a good question. Not a very good answer, but a good question. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we're going to go to Region 15, Rock Springs ISD, Rock Springs Elementary. Are you there? Yeah. Yes, we are. Okay. Hello, Mrs. Bush. My name is Julie May. I am a fifth grader at Rock Springs Elementary. My teacher is Mrs. Fulton, and my librarian is Mrs. Scroggins. Our question is, were you a good reader when you were in elementary school? If so, how did you become a good reader, or what was your secret? <laughs> um, thank you very much, Julia May. Uh, I was a good reader. My dad was in the publishing business, so I had very little choice. Now, we didn't have television. Uh, we, didn't, we had uh, radio. But radio is not half as interesting as reading. And my dad would bring home books, and then we'd, I remember so well sitting on the couch with my mother and my father and a reluctant brother or two and reading. And we would read aloud. And in those days, I remember the Saturday Evening Post had cereals, and they had Agatha Christie, and we would, came once a week, this magazine. Daddy would bring it home, and then my, he'd read it on the train. My mother would read it, and then I'd get to read it. So we, we read uh, Ten Little Indians in serial form. It was exciting, and then we could talk about it. So I think um, I, it wasn't any secret. It was just my family read with me. I was the third of four children, and I was so glad to have someone pay attention to me in a family where my younger brother, the fourth child, was very sick, and a lot of time was spent on him. So the reading time was extraordinarily precious to me. I was probably a little spoiled, too. <laughs> um, we're going to go to Region 8, Chapel Hill ISD, Chapel Hill Elementary. Are you there? Yes, we are. Go ahead, honey. Hello, Mrs. Bush. My name is Brandon. I'm in the fifth grade. Mm -hmm. This is my reading teacher, and Mrs. Ramsey is my librarian. My question is, what was the first book you read that got you excited to read? What was the first book I read that I was excited to read, got me excited to read? The book I remember, and it was a year older than you, a class ahead of you, I remember reading A Tale of Two Cities, and I'm sort of a romantic. And so uh, I loved that book. It was sort of scary, the French Revolution, but uh, a man laid down his life for his friend and for the girl he loved, who loved his friend. That's making Charles Dickens a little simplified. But I loved that book, and I often wonder if sixth graders today would read that book and could enjoy it. It's, I wonder. Some of them, I'm sure. I hope. Yeah. Yes, I'm sure. That's the first book. What was the first book you read that got you excited to read? <laughs> the Magician's Nephew. What was it? The Magician's Nephew. Oh, really? Oh, The Magician's Nephew. That's well, that's great. great. You yeah. had an answer. I'm proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> I, bet, I bet I could ask everyone in this room. They wouldn't come up with that. But that's very good, and I'm very proud of you. Okay, I'm going to 
go ahead and move on to Region 4, Pasadena ISD, South Shaver Elementary. Are you there? Yes, ma'am, we're here. Good morning, Ms. Bush. My name is Michelle. I am in third grade. Ms. Gaitan is my teacher and my school is my librarian. My question is, which book did you enjoy writing more, your memoir or Millie's book? Oh, well, you know, uh, Millie wrote her book. She dictated <laughs> it to me. <laughs> but uh, Millie's book was a lot of fun. And uh, I, here's a question. I, I wonder how many keep diaries. Because I kept diaries the whole time, well, almost all my life, either in letters I wrote to my family or just diaries. And I kept diaries, so writing the memoir was easy. I just had to pick parts that I, all my life's been exciting. But I, I kept diaries so I could remember a lot. And so that made it easy. But Millie's book was a lot of fun. Did you read Millie's book? Do you know? No. No. <laughs> Millie's book's out of print, darn it. <laughs> but Millie's book tells you fun things about the White House. And she was so naughty, she sat on all those beautiful satin <laughs> chairs, and she had a very good time at the White House. Thank you for your question. OK, we're going to go to Region 1. Sapata County ISD, Sapata North Elementary. Are you there? We're here. <laughs> More than here. <laughs> We're here. Good. Hello, Mrs. B My name is Laura. I am in the fifth grade. Mrs. Medina is my teacher and Mrs. Vela is my librarian. My question is, what inspired you to start the Barbara Bush Foundation for Family Literacy? That's a very good question. Mm -hmm. You know, I worried, truthfully worried, about people not being able to read. And then out of the blue one day, I was honored by USA Today. Don't ask me why, but I was. And they gave me a check for $100,000. And I could spend it on anything I wanted. Well. I, I just couldn't spend it on me or my children, so I decided I would start a foundation, and um, that was 20 years ago or so. And we have given almost $40 million away to 600 or 700 uh, literacy programs around the country. And I, I think a lot of people can read now because of that that $100,000. Imagine giving me $100,000. <laughs> anyway, that's what inspired me to start the foundation. But it's because we have to read. And Texas is behind. We're, we're such a great state that we really should, I'm, I'm on a new kick now, which is every person, no matter what age, what they do, do they have children or not, ought to take schools into their view and they ought to help the teachers. They ought to, teachers can't be mothers, fathers, doctors, whatever. You've got to help, help them. And so I'm really very strong on the fact that we have to strengthen our public schools and we have to help our children. Thank you for your question. Okay, we're going to go to Region 4, Aylid ISD, Owens Intermediate. Are you there? Yes. We're here. <laughs> Hello, Mrs. Bush. My name is Jasmine. I am in the sixth grade. Ms. Parrish is my reading teacher, and Ms. Scholl is my librarian. My question is, what do you enjoy most about your time after leaving the White House? Friends. That's a great question. You know, I, I loved the White House, but I never missed one day of it. I loved my friends. We came home to Houston, and the neighbors, we rented a little house while we built a house, and uh, next door, practically. And our neighbors planted the rented house garden. They cleaned the house. They unpacked everything before we got home. And when George and I came home, you might think we'd be sad, and we were 
nobody likes to lose, but uh, there was a truck on the highway that, and it said, welcome home, George and Barbara. Mm. And we loved that. But I love a and M. I I love coming up here. There's not enough time in the day to do all we like. So uh, I'm, I'm very happy at home. My friends mostly, I must confess, I love seeing. Mm. Okay, we'll do our last one from certainly not least, uh, Region 7, Tyler ISD, Jones <coughs> Elementary. Are you there? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead, ask your question. Hello, Mrs. Bush. My name is Jamia. I am in the third grade. Ms. Culpepper is my teacher, and Ms. Shirley is my librarian. My question is, what do you feel is your greatest accomplishment being the first lady? That sounds like bragging, <laughs> if I tell you what my greatest accomplishment is. <laughs> but um, I would say the Barbara Bush Foundation, the fact that so many more children can read now. I believe in family literacy because I think the mother and father should learn to read at the same time the child is learning. Otherwise, how can, how can they know how they're doing in school? And it helps them get a job. So I think probably, although I'm embarrassed because other people do most of the work, like Shirley and others, <laughs> do most of the work and I get the credit. I do raise the money <laughs> and that's not easy. But thank you for your question. And you know, someone else who didn't come in was going to ask me my favorite book. Can we yes. try them or do you think they're gone? Um, I'll check. Uh, Mrs. Solo, uh, I believe there was a question about Mrs. Bush's favorite book. Are, are we done with going to schools now? Is that there our last one? one that didn't come on. It may be. Um, I could try, oh yes, um, I could actually try Friendship ISD Willow Bend Elementary was the one, the, the district that was going to ask about favorite types of books to read. Willow Bend Elementary, are you there? Bennett the Elementary is here from Friendship. Oh, good. Oh, good. <laughs> okay, could you ask your question? question? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Hello. Hello, Miss Bush. Hello, Miss Bush. My name is Vanessa Fair. My teacher is Miss Robertson. My library is Miss Cat. Yeah. We are studying children's authors. Who is your favorite children's author and book? Oh, children's author. I spent a wasted morning <laughs> <laughs> trying to think of <laughs> Anthony Trollope. But for those of you who are interested, Anthony Trollope. Jane Austen and Maeve Vinci are my adults, but my favorite children author. I'd have to say, I can't remember her name, but um, I, I, I really didn't like Harry Potter's books, but I loved the fact that boys and girls, but mostly boys, well, I used to go to fifth grade and I'd say, okay, who likes to read? The girls' hands all went up, no boys. Once Harry Potter came into our life, boys all read. So I'd have to put Harry Potter down as my favorite author, author for children's books. And I'm so glad you got to be there. You're absolutely ravishingly beautiful. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Mrs. Solo, is that the last school now? I believe so. Thank All right. you. All right. Well, thank you very much for coordinating that and setting us up with the schools across the state of Texas and a special welcome to our friends in the UK that are joining us as well. Thank you uh, for all your time today and for the work you did from the Region 6. Thank you. Mrs. Bush, I don't mean to go off script, but if you're prepared about your favorite book, did you have one? Because I'm kind of curious. Well, I, Anthony Trollope was my favorite. Oh, Got it. I've read everything he's written. I just couldn't remember his name this morning. I was desperate. <laughs> That's okay. And uh, I love Maeve Vinci, who's an Irish writer. And uh, Jane Austen, 
is, is one of my very, right. very favorites. All right. And thanks to all the students that have joined us again. I think they had some very good questions this morning and did a really nice job. Beatrice Gormley is here today sitting beside Mrs. Bush. She decided to become a writer when she was just nine years old. And before we hear from our reading buddies today, Beatrice Gormley is going to share some insights about the fun and the challenges of being an author. Mrs. Gormley? Thank you. I am so happy and excited to be here today in Texas and uh, here with, with Mrs. Bush and the Reading Buddies and all you students and teachers uh, here and across the, the state of Texas. It's a real privilege. Yes, when I was nine years old, I decided that I wanted to be a writer. I know that many of you students are thinking about what you'd like to be when you grow up when you get out of school. And um, maybe you want to be a veterinarian because you love animals. Or maybe you want to be a teacher because you, you want to help people learn. Or maybe an astronaut because you're fascinated with outer space. Or maybe you want to be a writer like me. Uh, we're so lucky that we live in a free country where we can choose what we want to be. So why did I choose to become a writer? I think it was because I loved to read so much. Every, I, I read all kinds of books. I read encyclopedias, I read fairy tales, I read Bible stories, biographies, dog stories, um, mysteries, science fiction. I loved to read. Every, every uh, week I'd go to the library and get a huge stack of books. I could hardly carry them out. I got so many books. And um, so I thought if reading books is so much fun, Writing books must be fun, too, so I'm going to be a writer. I, um, besides reading, as I was growing up, I wrote a lot. I wrote for school, of course, but I also wrote in my diary, and I wrote letters and poems and stories. Um, I, I wrote a lot, and, and I noticed that what, the more I wrote, the better I could write. And the better I could write, the more I liked it. So I was sure that I wanted to be a writer when I grew up. When I got out of school, um, I started sending my stories to a book publishing company, hoping that they would publish them as, as real books that thousands of people could read at the same time. But publishing companies are in business to make money. And if they don't think that the author's book is going to make money for them, they send it back, they reject it. And so this happened to me over and over. And um, I got so many rejection slips, uh, I didn't know what to do with them. Once I, I met an author who knew what to do with his rejection letters, he wallpapered his bathroom with them. <laughs> I thought, what a good idea, <laughs> those nasty rejection slips. Um, in, the, in the meantime, some wonderful things happened to me. I got married to my dear husband, Bob, who's sitting over there in the audience, and we had two children, Katie and Jenny. Um, Katie and Jenny love to read, too, just the way Bob and I do. And um, they encouraged me to write. They were sure I was going to become a writer in spite of all these rejections. And one day, when Katie was nine, she came to me with an idea. She said, Mom, write a, write a story about a girl who can fly. And so I thought, that's a good idea. So I, I, I went into my office, I sat down. Uh, my cats helped me, they always do. I, I started writing this, this story about a, a girl who could somehow fly. And to my surprise, this turned out to be the best story I'd ever written. And I, when I was finished, I thought, oh, now I, want th I really want thousands of people to read this story. So I sent it to a book publisher, and I waited for them to tell me that they were going to publish my book. But they sent my story back, not with a letter of rejection, but with a letter saying, this could be a really good story if you would do some research so that you know what you're talking about, about flying and so on, and um, rewrite the whole thing from beginning to end, <laughs> and, and, yeah, and make it 50 pages longer. What? 
I've already worked so hard on this story. They want me to rewrite the whole thing. So I, um, I was kind of mad and discouraged. But I, I went back in my office. My cats came to. We sat down and started writing again. And I wrote the whole thing from beginning to end. All new words, new sentences, new paragraphs. And when I finished, my story was 10 times as good. I, th I, I was so happy and excited. I sent it back to the book publishing company, because now I really wanted thousands of people to read it. And sure enough, the next year, my very first book, Mail Order Wings, was published. And I knew I'd finally done what I said I was going to do when I was nine, when I said, I'm going to be a writer. So if any of you want to become writers, uh, don't give up. Keep trying. Keep working at it. And what, whatever, whatever you want to become, keep working. Follow your dream. All Thank right. you very much. Thank you. We have three pair of reading buddies joining us today who will read about three first ladies whose husbands have presidential libraries in our state of Texas. Let's listen to the fifth graders first of all from Neal Elementary School. Their principal is Ms. Asbury and they're with the Bryan ISD, Neal Elementary. My name is Dariah and this is Marcus. Our teachers are Ms. Bailey, Ms. Moore, and Mr. Gomez. Our librarian is Ms. Yuzik. We will read about Claudia Alta Taylor Johnson, nicknamed Lady Bird, who is married to President Lyndon Baines Johnson, the 36th president. The Johnsons had two daughters, Linda Bird and Lucy Baines. Her father, a rancher and general store owner, taught his daughter about business. Lady Bird was near the top of her the top of her class at St. Mary's Episcopal Girls School in Austin and also at the University of Texas in 1933. Because of her sharp business sense, she handled their finances. In 1937, Lady Bird Johnson was proud to put up the money from her inheritance for her husband's successful campaign for Congress. She bought a radio station in Austin and developed it into a thriving business. To take part in her husband's career, Lady Bird Johnson took speaking lessons. In 1960, Senator Johnson ran for vice president with John F. Kennedy. In a close campaign, Mrs. Johnson's tour of the South may have made the difference. <clears throat> lady Bird Johnson continued to be a trooper as second lady filling in for the president's wife at many functions. On November 22, 1963, the Johnsons were in the motorcade in Dallas where President Kennedy was shot. As a result, Mr. Johnson became president. As always, President Johnson talked over his work with his wife. Ms. Johnson hoped to widen opportunities for American women. She urged her husband to appoint women to government positions. During President Johnson's next term, Ms. Johnson persuaded Congress to pass the Highway Beautification Act and encouraged conservation groups. She also promoted Head Start, a federal program for disadvantaged children. The Johnsons retired to the LBJ Ranch in Texas. There, they enjoyed ranch life and their grandchildren. She founded the National Wildfire Research Center. She was a trustee for the National Geographic Society and the American Conservation Association. In her last years, she remained active at the Wildfire Center. Thank you. Thank you for reading about Lady Bird Johnson this morning. There's some students here representing some exemplary schools, and one of those is Johnson Elementary, a blue ribbon school. Their principal is Mrs. Happ. They're with the Bryan ISD, so let's make welcome the fifth graders from Johnson Elementary. My name is Lena, and this is Evelyn. Our teachers are Mrs. Brenner, Ms. Robinson, and Mr. Smith. Our librarian is Ms. Moore. We are honored to read about First Lady Barbara Pierce Bush, the wife of President George Herbert Walker Bush, the 41st President. 
They are the proud parents of six children, George W., Robin, Jeb, Neil, Marvin, and Dorothy. During Christmas vacation of 1941, Barbara met George Bush, a student at Phillips Academy, at a dance. They saw each other during vacation and wrote constantly. In summer of 1943, before Barbara entered Smith College, they were engaged. George was in the Navy and fighting in World War II. During George's leave, they were married in 1945 when Barbara was 19. After the war, George Bush finished his education at Yale. Then the Bushes moved to Texas and he went into the oil business. Strong, cheerful, and energetic, Mrs. Bush ran the household and family while Mr. Bush traveled. In 1953, their three-year-old daughter, Robin, became ill with leukemia. They were devastated by Robin's death and created a foundation for leukemia research in Robin's name. In 1966, Mr. Bush won a seat in Congress from Texas. As a political wife, Mrs. Bush was supportive and outgoing. She was also a good sport about further moves during the 1970s caused by Mr. Bush's various appointments. In 1975, Mr. Bush was recalled to the United States from China. Barbara Br Bush branched out in a positive way by touring the country with a lecture and slide presentation about China. In 1980, George Bush was elected vice president to Ronald Reagan. During her eight years as second lady, Barbara Bush made literacy her special project. When George Bush ran for president in 1988, Barbara Bush was a big asset to his campaign with her warm, direct manner. She had become a shrewd, tough-minded politician in spite of her claim not to know diddly <laughs> about politics. She sat in on planning sessions and Mr. Bush talked over everything with her in private. Barbara Bush ran a relaxed White House full of grandchildren and dogs. Her book, Millie's Book, as dictated to Barbara Bush, was about life in the Bush White House from the point of view of her Springer Spaniel. She donated profits from this best-selling book to her newly created Barbara Bush Foundation for Family Literacy. As First Lady, Barbara Bush also urged compassion for victims of AIDS. Since retiring to Houston, she has kept a busy schedule of traveling and speaking, often to raise money for charitable causes. <clears throat> also, she has written two best-selling books. Barbara Bush, A Memoir, and Reflections, Life After the White House. Mrs. Bush has the distinction of being the only First Lady other than Abigail Adams to have both a husband and a son elected President of the United States. Mrs. Bush still heads the Barbara Bush Foundation for Family Literacy. Since its launch, the foundation has awarded over $39 million to support the development and expansion of 850 family literacy programs in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. She continues to make personal appearances to promote her favorite cause, literacy. <laughs> Thank you for reading about our First Lady, Barbara Bush. Now let's listen to Bryan Independent School District's Mitchell Elementary School fifth grader. Their principal is Mrs. Casper, Mitchell Elementary. My name is Tyler and this is Ellie. Our homeroom teacher is Miss Estes and our librarian is Miss Taylor. We will read about Laurel Welsh Bush, the wife of President George Walker Bush, the 43rd president. The Bushes have two daughters, Barbara and Jenna, named after the girls' grandmothers. Her mother read to her from the time she was a baby and really became one of Laura's favorite activities. By the age of seven, Laura knew she wanted to be a teacher. She was popular with she was popular with her peers as well as her teachers. She earned high marks in school, and, re and she enjoyed swimming and hiking as well as reading. Graduating from Southern Methodist University, University in Dallas, Laura taught in elementary schools for a few years. She earned a master's degree 
in library science at the University of Texas in Austin and happily became a school librarian. She met George at a barbecue given by mutual friends. The two were immediately taken with each other. George thought Laura was beautiful, smart, and a great listener. Laura loved the way George made her laugh. When George was elected governor of Texas, Laura quickly realized she could use position to push her favorite causes, literacy and education. When Laura Bush became first lady of the United States, she used her high profile position to promote literacy and education, just as she had in Texas. She launched a national initiative called Ready to Read, Ready to Learn. She hosted the first White House conference on school libraries, and she proposed a $10 million program to recruit more librarians. Laura founded and hosted successful national book festivals in Washington, D.C. On September 11, 2001, the country was stunned by terrorist attacks. As the First Lady, she felt she had the responsibility to be steady for our country and for her husband. She took on a more public role, appearing at memorial services, vigils, and speaking out on issues. First Lady Laura Bush continued to be very popular. In interviews and public appearances, she remained a comforting presence for the nation, as she always had for her husband. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to say thank you to all of our reading buddies, and I've just got to say, Marcus, if you're going to be the only young man, I tell you right now, you dress like a sharp-dressed man. I just want to give you some credit for that. <laughs> Great job by all of you today. Well, of course, today we want to show admiration, respect, and appreciation of our beloved First Lady Barbara Bush for her generous service to the cause of literacy, which has literally transformed so many lives in our country. It's now our pleasure to welcome the Agonizers. They are a quartet from the Singing Cadets of Texas A&M, directed by David Kipp. Please make welcome the Agonizers. We are a small group within the Scene Cadets, the Agonizers, and we'd like to dedicate this song to our favorite Rose, Mrs. Bush. A youth one day in a garden fair, a rose found withered and dying, and all for love, for love in vain. This rose was sadly sighing. Heart of my heart, I love you. Life would be not without. Forget you never from you I never can sever. Say you'll be mine forever. I And now we're going to do a song for you guys, and it's about our favorite sandwich. <laughs> 
You've got hockeys and heroes and ham on whole wheat, grilled cheese, BLTs, pita bread stuffed with meat, tuna fish and egg salad, sloppy joes and paninis, and don't forget gyros, French dip and crostini. Luigi. But the greatest uh, of sandwiches, king of them all. No offense uh, to you, dear dad's veggie burger supreme. It's a sandwich preferred any time, night or day. The American legend. Good old PBJ. Oh, I'm peanut butter. Jelly, and we're so happy on a little piece of little pizza. I remember the first time that I saw you sitting across the cupboard with your other jelly friends. Cause you're so, Cause sweet, you're so sweet, sweet, and I am chunky. You're, you're low fat, well, I'm working on that. Cause I'm peanut butter, and you are jelly, and we're so happy on a little piece of bread. I met grape and strawberry, but your raspberry, and that's my favorite kind. Please forgive me for my stint with honey. I looked on the label and not what was inside, but you're so, but sweet, you're so sweet, and I am chunky. You're low fat, well, I'm working on that. Cause I'm peanut butter and you are jelly And we're so happy on a little piece of bread I remember the first time that I saw you Sitting across the cupboard with your other jelly friends Cause you're so sweet, you're so sweet And I am chunky You're low fat when I'm working on that Cause I'm peanut butter and you are jelly And we're so happy on a little piece of bread Start together, we're so happy on a little piece of bread together we're so happy on a little piece of bread and now we'd like you to stand and join us in singing god bless america From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam. God bless America, my home sweet home. God bless America, my home sweet Special thanks again to the Agonizers, the quartet from the Seeing Cadets of Texas A&M. So proud of you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, we would like to say thank you to everyone for helping to make this possible, but especially two of our guests of honor, to Mrs. Bush and to Mrs. Gormley for all of your commentary today and for sharing those words with us, the agonizers, all students, teachers, librarians, and to all of you joining us uh, through the Region 6 network. Reading provides you with an exciting discovery of adventures. Find a reading buddy, enjoy your time reading, and take a little time to sing along the way. Now, in this auditorium, I'd like to ask that you please stay in your seat as Mrs. Bush leaves and then we'll all be dismissed at the same time. But again, Mrs. Bush and uh, Mrs. Gormley, thank you so much for including us in your plans today.